Hello everyone. In this class, we are going to talk about two different topics, but they are related. One is relative chronology. The other one is Saint Chips. There are two types of Saint Chips, which are Push Chain and Pull Chain. We will talk about always two types. First, let's learn about relative chronology in a brief manner. Uh, by the term itself, it's called chronology, so it's a kind of a sequence. A, a sound is, sorry, uh, a sound change happened in a particular period of time in the history of a particular language in which it takes place or took place rather because we are talking about the diachronic parameter of sound changes. Some sound changes may take place in the language at some earlier stage and then those changes ceased to be active at some after some point of time whereas other sound changes may take place at some later stage in the language's history. So there may be some relative chronology depending on the period of time when those sound changes occurred in a particular language's history. Often in the case of different changes from different times, evidence is left behind which provides us with the clues to determine their relative chronology. So when which sound was produced and how they are related to each other, all those things we can determine because sometimes some clues have been uh, have remained of even after a particular sound change has ceased to be active now. Uh, so that also helps us to determine the relative chronology that is also known as the temporal order in which the sound changes took place. This is more or less similar to rule ordering of synchronic phonology. If you remember, rule ordering were of four types, feeding, bleeding, counterfeeding and counterbleeding. So this relative chronology conceptually are related or similar to the rule ordering that we learned in synchronic phonology. Part of working out the phonological history of a language is determining how the relative chronology of those changes have affected the entire language's sound system. The different stages of Grimm's law which was first proposed by Jacob Grimm in 1822 in his Germanic grammar, illustrates a, a particular case of relative chronology. In the Germanic um, uh, history, the history of Germanic languages, in a particular stage that was, I mark it as stage one, where Proto-Indo-European, which you know that uh, that was the ancestor of all the languages which are, you know, Indo-European language family now, including Germanic branches. So Proto-Indo-European, but uh, all these sounds are Proto because they are reconstructed. At some point of time in stage one, all those sounds had become further her. That means stops became fricatives. Okay, so it's a fricativization process or spirantization. So voiceless stops became fricatives. All, all the fricatives are also devoiced or voiceless. Another stage, after some point of time, the, some other Indo-European sounds, which are the set of voice stops, they became pata ka. Now, instead of becoming fricatives, now they have become the voiceless counterpart of those sounds. So, bada ka became pata ka. Okay, all the sounds remained stops, but the voicing is uh, now changed. The relative chronology of these two changes is clear, since if the sound change, that is, voice stops to the voiceless stops, had taken place before the first sound change, that is, voiceless stops became fricative then all the stops would have ended up being voiceless fricatives. So the language would have no voiceless uh, uh, stops now. But that is not the case. Both the original voiceless stops and later ones from the uh, change of voice stops to voiceless. So had it been the other way around, if stage 2 occurred before stage 1 or this particular sound change occurred before this one, so we would have assumed that the language does not have any voice, any any kind of stops 
because all the Badagas have become Patakas and Patakas have become, you know, Fathaha. So the language will not have any, would not have any stops in their inventory, but that is not the case. That means that is not the correct rule ordering in synchronic chronology and in this case we say relative chronology so chronology is different some of the stops which are which were voiceless became voiceless fricatives and those voice stops became voiced voiceless uh, stops not any other fricative or any other say any other sound change occurred therefore clearly the voiceless stops became fricative first and then once this these were changed and out of the way the voice stops later became voiceless in that relative chronology so that is the order of those two changes that occurred in between um, uh, proto indo european uh, proto indo european to germanic languages so that is how relative chronology is determined and that really affects a language's particular sound inventory because in, a, in the Germanic languages today, you find both traces of uh, fricatives like further herb and uh, voiceless uh, plosives, and that means this is a correct uh, order of these two sound changes. So you can look into more examples from your textbook, um, which are from Swedish and Finnish languages. You can read them on your own. Now I come to the same sips. The part of phonological space within the vocal tract which produces the vowels, as you know, is, the, is known as the vowel space. Interestingly, the changes that occur in the vowel space often exhibit some interesting patterns. One example can be found in the example called great vowel shift, short form ZVS of English. English had undergone some interesting uh, changes in regards to the vowels. Let's consider the dramatic set of changes which affected the English long or tense vowels. Let's say, let's uh, just use the word long for uh, from now. Those long vowels towards the end of the Middle English period. Between Saucerian age to Shakespearean age, English underwent a series of interrelated vowel changes known as the Great Vowel Shift in which long vowels systematically raise their positions if there were long vowels they raise their positions okay so one step higher and those long vowels which were the, at the highest position in the uh, vowel space were diphthongous because for them there was no other space to raise themselves Middle English had a systematic system of seven long vowels, as you can see here, E, A, 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 O, O, U, all of them had long counterparts, as in these words, as can be seen in this example, as you can see, all these words have changed their pronunciation drastically in, into the modern English that, that we speak or that is, um, you know, comfortably perceived by us. The two high vowels E and O were diphthongized to O and O respectively, like in, as you can see here, right, so it was reader before, now it's right, or you know, at the earlier time it was right, now it's right, so in Indian English pronunciation today, in the synchronic Indian English, we say as right, ah, uh, we use ah, uh, but the British English speakers uh, towards the uh, you know, uh, end of modern uh, Middle English, they pronounced it as a. Uh. Now those two sounds, uh, e long e had become a, and long u had become a o, okay, respectively. The two mid high mid vowels a and o were raised to e and u slots. The two low mid vowels a and o were raised to a and o slots. And the low vowels a was raised into a and so on. So this is a diagrammatic, this is a data set and these two are two diagrammatic representation of the great vowel shift in English CVS in short. 
As you can see here, A became A, A became A, A, A became E, and then it became long E. If you remember, it became O, uh, OI, right? And O became O, and O became O, and O in turn became a diphthong. And this is more clearly represented in this diagram where you can see clearly this diacritic O is also used as a uh, was used as a convention to indicate length of vowels. Don't confuse between these two. This is the IPA con convention and this was an earlier convention to indicate a length of a vowel. So as you can see, one step higher was the raising parameters for the vowels. But for the highest vowel, there was no other space to go to raise themselves. So what they did, they adopted some uh, you know, similarity like the existing diphthong. So this is kind of a change shift. Okay. So this is the way how those vowels have changed themselves. There are two types of chain shifts. One is pull chain, as I said, which is also known as drag chain. And the other one is push chain. In pull chain, one change may create a hole in the phonemic pattern or an asymmetry, also known as a gap, which is followed by another change which fills the hole by pulling some other sound from somewhere else in the system and changing that sound to fit the need of the symmetry or naturalness so that it fills the gap. And if the sound which shifted to fill the original hole in the pattern leaves a new hole elsewhere in the pattern, then some other sense may pull the pull some other sound to fill in that gap. Yeah. So in pull chain, if some change is happening, so if R had changed to A, then what happens? What happened to the R slot? R now remains vacant or there is a gap created. So to fill that gap, somebody has to come and fill that. So this is kind of a pull chain. One, oh, one gap is created due to a particular sound change and that gap has to be filled by this uh, by the language's sound inventory so so some other change has to take place so that that gap has to be filled so change shifts are uh, uh, are clearly noted in the zvs of english great vowel shift so a gap can be seen here a became a so what happens a is now vacant so to fill that gap, what happens that the last vowel here, the highest vowel E becomes something like A, but it cannot clearly become A, but it adopts certain diphthongal parameter into it and that it becomes a clear diphthong. It cannot just come to be, become A because that will again, you know, give a asymmetrical pattern to the language's sound inventory. So that will create some other uh, conflicts. Okay, so pull chain basically talks about how to balance between or how to not leave any gap in a language's sound inventory. Okay, so ZVS is a good example of this kind of a, of a chain shift that is called pull chain. So you can read this. The diphthongization in ZVS would le would have left two gaps in the pattern where the high vowels had formerly been and the two high mid vowels could have been attracted upwards to fill those gaps this in turn would have left gaps behind the high mid positions inducing the low mid vowels upward to fill these new holes leaving two more holes behind again with the low vowel than rounding things off by moving up into the into one of those gaps leaving a final unfilled gap behind it this is very interesting but little complex the kind of sense is a drag scene a uh, drag scene is particularly defined as a scene that starts with the introduction of some holes with which drag some other segments into them thereby creating more holes third drag some other segments into them and so on so it is a repetitive pattern so 
a particular sound change creates a gap in the sounds in uh, lang language sound inventory and then that gap has to be filled up by something some other change okay and then when that other change happens then the you know original sound creates another hole in its position so this is a, a whole creation and then pull pulling other sounds into fill up those gaps and so on so this is kind of a you know circularity problem next is pushin the idea behind pushin is that languages want to maintain differences between sounds in the system in order to facilitate understanding this actually is based on a notion called maximum or maximal differentiation so the more distinctiveness we can create in a language sound inventory the more productive the language can be the processing of what is heard or you know we can perceive if a sound starts starts changing by moving into the articulatory space of another sound in the push in view it this can precipitate a change where the sound moves away from and crossing one in order to maintain distinctions important to meaning so to create meaning to observe more meaningful words we need more um, uh, differentiation in the language sound inventory that is as clear as that if the fleeing sound is pushed towards the articulatory space of some other sound then it it too may shift to avoid that encroachment the setting of a chain reaction called push chain sometimes the notion called maximum differentiation is called upon in these instances the idea behind maximum differentiation is that the sounds in a system tend to be distributed so as to allow as much perception difference between them as the articulatory space can provide so as much as widely you can arrange certain sounds in the inventory of the language then you can have more distinctive distinctiveness between the sounds and that gives you more productivity into the meaning paradigm of the language pure push chains are comparatively rare rarer than pull chain so if a language has only three vowels so let's assume a language allows only three vowels so which vowels do you think will be the choice of the language one will be e the high front unrounded vowel the other one will be u high back rounded and the last one will be r that is low central or back unrounded so that those three will be maximally differentiated in terms of their distance from each other so they will be equidistant from each other so that gives us a information that okay if a language allows only three vowels these will be the three vowels instead if you select e or e and lax e this is a lax e and its uh, counterpart the unrounded uh, counterpart of itself then do you think that will be a correct assumption that this language has these three vowels no because the belief is confirmed by language uh, sorry uh, you cannot uh, expect to uh, expect that the language will bunch up all the three vowels in one articulatory space it has to create maximum differentiation so that the hearer the the speaker and the hearer um, you know it gets comprehended through the meaning that is exposed with the help of those sounds if another language has four stops it allows us four stop we do not expect them to be bunched at one point of articulation let's say all labials p b adjective p and f or let's say her with none other points of articulation do you think this will be the more possible this is a possibility that if a language allows us four stops in the oral class of um, uh, oral stop category in the manner of articulation do you think this will be the four this will be the only four sounds no because you cannot assume that only one point of place of articulation it will be exploited it has to be spread across labial alveolar velar or other some other point of articulation it can be uvular sometimes it can be palatal but at least three points of articulations they are common 
commonly found in languages that labial, alveolar and velar must be there with one and an additional another one. Maximum differentiation is often hypothesized as an underlying motivation in senses, especially in case of pushing. So behind the notion of pushing is the idea that there should be maximum differentiation. Uh, all kinds of senses, though however they start, can be plausibly interpreted as continuing in order to maximize the use of the available phonological space. The further apart contrasting segments are in phonological space, the easier it, it is to tell them apart when listening to speech and less likely misunderstanding. So to, to clear up all misunderstanding, to create maximum differentiation, a language has to create maximum uh, difference or distance between the sounds that they allow in this language's inventory. Now this is an exercise for you. Let us assume that language X allows only six consonants in its entire phonemic inventory, exploiting all the manners of articulation and all the places of articulation. But only six consonants are allowed in the language out of all these you know, uh, points of, uh, as you can see in the IPA chart. What may be the six plausible sound in the language? You can take help of the IPA chart and formulate its phonemic inventory based on the notion called maximal or ma maximum differentiation. This is an exercise for you. You can convert um, your, uh, you can draw it in a PPT slide and convert it into a JPG file and send back to me. Thank you.